Okay, cool. And then should I stay on this side or what's the better way? Whatever you want to do. Okay, cool. Wow, dude, I just want to do the mic interference thing. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right, well, welcome. Um, so today we're going to be talking about TensorFlow GPU perf tuned containers with OpenShift. My name is Bill Rainford. I'm a software engineering manager and senior principal software engineer at Red Hat. And with me today is my partner on this project, Parul. Hi, everyone. I'm Parul Singh, and I work as a software engineer on the office of CTO. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit overview, kind of what we're going to cover today. The outline would be, first we are going to talk about Chris Research Integration System, or Chris as we call it, and the reason behind is this is going to be a platform where we are going to run uh, machine learning workflows. After that, we will talk a bit about the technology stack behind this demonstration. And we're going to talk about doing local development and running on your local CPU. And then we will see how to build and deploy and what are the configurations that you need to do to run it on OpenShift. And we're going to talk about things like hardware acceleration, making use of the GPU, and performance tuning and related best practices. All right, so um, a little bit about Project Chris. And so Project Chris is a medical image processing platform. And um, it's an open source project, which is a collaboration between Red Hat, uh, Boston University, uh, Boston Children's Hospital, and the Massachusetts Open Cloud. And what you can see here is, is a rendering of some of the UI that we've got. And so some of the Red Hat UI UX engineers have helped with this. And in doing this sort of medical image processing, there are a lot of images, there's a lot of computations that happen in order to make meaningful insights on this sort of data. So like a brain scan like this, normally you've got multiple slices of images there, and that's something that's kind of hard for the average human to really digest, uh, let alone in mass if you've got lots of images that you want to do uh, research or, or, or make inferences on. And so part of it's being able to annotate these sorts of things, um, apply AI, apply machine learning um, to try and solve some of these medical sorts of problems. And this, we use OpenShift Jaw Framework to run the image processing algorithms. And the real reason is behind is that we, right now, medical image processing takes days to hours, and we want to reduce that time to minutes and seconds so that the results are clinically relevant. We're going to talk about the technology stack that's involved in this effort. We are developing, obviously, a machine learning application, which is a very naive example. What we have taken is MNESIT upstream uh, open source project, and it does is identify handwritten digits. And we are using the same uh, repository. By the way, our code is available online, and it's an open source. And at the end of the presentation, we will give away all the links that we have. And one of the technologies we use is TensorFlow, which is an open source project uh, started by Google that allows us to have a common way of um, developing and sharing models. And we'll talk more about that later. And for GPU acceleration, we are using NVIDIA CUDA so that you, it's a general, uh, it is a model by which you can run general computing on GPUs. And we'll talk about the OpenShift container platform, uh, which helps uh, orchestrate and, and manage the container environment that we use to run a lot of this. Just to let you know, we want to keep this demo very interactive, so feel free to stop anywhere you have any questions. Just raise your hand, the mic would come to you. Don't, don't hesitate to stop us anywhere if you don't understand. And I just want to take a moment, too, to kind of pull the room uh, just to kind of understand where folks are in terms of experience, that sort of thing. Um, by, by a quick show of hands, how many folks in the room are familiar with or have used TensorFlow? Okay. Cool. What about people who have used NVIDIA or not, like tried to use NVIDIA and then gave up? <laughs> and, and how many folks have used the uh, OpenShift container platform? And, and uh, Kubernetes, which, which is derived from? Okay, cool. Thank you. So uh, those of you who don't know what's OpenShift, OpenShift is a containerized, is a set of family of containerized application uh, that was developed by Red Hat. And the flagship product is OpenShift Container Platform that helps you to deploy and build your application inside a container. And as Bill mentioned, it is backed by Kubernetes. So it is orchestrating and monitoring and managing your containers using Kubernetes API. And the question of why we're using it, not just because of Red Hat employees, but because there's you know a wide uh, community that helps support it. Um, it also has broad acceptance about the public clouds, so whether it be Amazon, Google, Azure, those sorts of things. How 
many of you are building containerized application as a part of your job or hobby or anything? Okay, so can you tell me one of the problems that you face or something that's the most annoying thing about developing containerized application? Life cycle. Sometimes the container images might become growing size. You know. Right. So the same, uh, when we were developing Bill and I, we were experiencing a lot of problems and few of them is like speed. It takes really long time to build your image. Every time that you are building an image, you have to install all the dependencies, like for example, your base images, CentOS or RHEL or anything, you install that. Then you install all the dependencies that are related to your application. So what we really wanted to do is that each iteration, we only wanted to rebuild what change not like you are not changing anything in rel or centos image but each time you install it so we wanted to remove that and increase the speed of building and deployment and the other trick was patchability so even in the case where we're not hit by the rebuild issues hey there's you know some security vulnerability came out and so we're going to be able to patch that image stack in a you know, hopefully less painful sort of way and the other piece is efficiency right and what are some optimizations we can make in terms of how we're building it um, and how fast they should turn around those images and the related changes and also we wanted to have a structure so that the layers that are independent of each other, they are isolated. So let's say that there is a vulnerability that was found on, it would never be the case, but let's say that something happens with RHEL, which is never going to be the case. We support RHEL really well. And, and you, you're changing nothing in your application layer, right? But you have to build all the layers again. So we wanted that the layers should be isolated from each other so that if you need to tweak or modify any of the layer, it's just that layer you're attacking or not all the layers. And we want our image to be reproducible. And by that, we mean that it should contain all the dependencies and libraries as input so that anybody can just take that image and reproduce any issues that I've been facing or Bill has been facing. It should be consistent with everyone. So we wanted a solution or a tool that is attends or that helps us to deal with all these problems. And this, <clears throat> the tool we came across is Source to Image, or S2I as we call it. And it is the way to write image easily. It will It is a tool that will take your application source as an input and create an image out of it and run your application inside a container. And here are the few steps. The first step is you take a builder image, and the builder image will have all the libraries and dependencies installed on it. And then you inject your application code. For us, our application source is, is residing at GitHub. So we pull the source code from the GitHub, and we assemble it into the builder container. And there is a assemble script that is run that will install all the dependencies that are related to the application code. And sorry, and then it will commit it as an application image. You can commit it anywhere. You can commit the image in Docker Hub. We are doing in uh, Red Hat internal uh, OpenShift internal registry. And once that is done, you have the application image. All you need to do is just run it inside a container. And one of the technology stack piece we're using is TensorFlow, which you know, is Google developed open source library for machine learning um, and for developing deep neural networks. And so um, what's shown here is the MNIST fashion data set. And so this is a open source data set of different fashion clothing, those sorts of things. And so those public um, domain data sets help us train different models and, and explore techniques and share things. And so um, TensorFlow really makes it a little easier for us to develop these sorts of models um, and be able to share them with others. So if I've got a complex model, I've got a massive data set, say, you know, something like this or something much bigger, I can go train that data set, save the model off, and then share it with somebody else. We can either use it as is or take that trained model and train it further based on the problem space they're trying to solve. And so that's really a, a powerful attraction mechanism for us. We are also using NVIDIA CUDA, which is everybody who has or not experienced with it knows how big a headache it is. Anybody who tried and gave up, like they started, oh, I'm going to use CUDA, and they said, oh, no, this is too much. Nobody? <laughs> OK, I was there, but then I was saved. <laughs> 
So uh, CUDA is a parallel computing platform and programming model that was created by NVIDIA, hence it's called NVIDIA CUDA. And it will give you all the set of libraries that will help you to run your application on GPU nodes and basically harness the power of GPU. Quick trivia, CUDA was initially, NVIDIA named CUDA as Compute Unified Device Architecture, but they themselves said, oh my God, this is too much, and they dropped it, so now it's CUDA, just CUDA. And if you deal into the fine prints of licensing of CUDA, you will see it's now free for distribution. So what it means is like you cannot give your containers with a, that has NVIDIA or uses NVIDIA CUDA to anybody else because that is not allowed. Your developers will be happy. They do provide, they do provide like NVIDIA CUDA in your chamber. Right? You, you can download the image, but you can't redistribute. You cannot redistribute. Oh. Yeah. So that's that's the catch. So either your uh, developers are happy or your lawyers are happy, <laughs> not both of them. So, but don't worry, we have found a solution to make both of them happy, and we will come on it later. Yeah. So, so that's a quick recap of the tech stack we're using. So with that technology, you know, how do we make it easier to access and develop AI and machine learning solutions? And yes, open source is a key piece of that, and we're going to talk about some of the other technologies to get around those issues around like the NVIDIA and other problems. Okay, so we have talked about a lot of challenge. Anybody faced any challenge in developing AI ML? It's not, I'm not talking about the kings of AI and ML. I'm talking about newcomers who recently started working in this field and said, oh no, this is again too much. Okay, so when I started at least, I was very overwhelmed. What What is the right libraries to use? Which version is compatible with what version? How to train my model, where to procure data set? And then uh, I realized that once I figured out everything, there was like how to make an efficient application, how to ensure the performance is good. And once I did everything of that, I was hit by this the whole factor of how to run this on GPU, how to make CUDA available for me. So I was like really overwhelmed when I just got into this field of AI and ML. So our suggestion or how we approach this problem is first ensure that you have trained your model and optimized your model. So that is giving the right inference. Like if you ask it, is this an orange or it's an apple, it doesn't classify as an elephant. So that's the first step that you need to do. And once you you have done that, build up your solution to address all the problem, or as Bill says. Make it work, make it fast, make it pretty, right? And that's always a challenge in software engineering, and deadlines and everything. Yeah. So well, the first demo we're going to talk about is using uh, TensorFlow to do machine learning on your local environment, so locally, running with your local CPU. And so in order to go do that, how do we set that up? And so um, basically what I do is I grab a publicly available base image. So in this case, it's like a CentOS 7 image that's got the S2I and Python already installed on it. And then I go install all my dependencies. So if I need a specific version of Python, TensorFlow, anything else that I need to kind of just be the baseline to do the work I need. And so this is all using a Docker file. Right? So simple Docker build. Uh, that becomes the new base image that I'm going to use for the project-specific work that I'm going to do in the next step. And so we use S2I, or source to image. Um, and basically what that does is allow me to, um, as, as Perl, I show that little diagram there and stuff, to try and separate um, our code development from the image itself. So with that base image there, I can run the S2I assemble script, which then installs all my app-specific source code. Uh, does any training, so I need to train my model. I can train that. And once I've got that in place, um, the S2I will then use the run script um, which they're basically what are saying in this case run the app uh, inference and so now I've got a base app here so I've got my application image I can push this to my repository um, and then I can go start instantiating it and running it and so uh, to run it simple docker run command on your local machine and so that gives me potentially multiple instances of a valid uh, application container and so uh, in the context of project Chris work that we're doing um, we're going to show a, little, a quick demo video of kind of how we do that So in this case, we start off, we, we clone the sample repo that we've got. So we're doing the clone right there. Uh, 
then we're going to do a make build, which is going to basically execute that Docker file, and that's going to build um, the base or the base image that we're going to use. So that's what we've got there. And then uh, we've got a how-to guide, so everything I've got here, uh, all the commands are, are exposed in that readme. And so we're going to grab the S2I build command that we've got here, and we're going to execute that. And so that's going to grab the image we just created. It's going to go uh, copy the source code over. It's going to set up anything that I care about, and then it's going to go train the model. And so in this case, we're using the MNIST uh, numeral uh, data set. It's doing the training there. It's saving up uh, the model that we care about. Now I've got that image ready to go. So with that, uh, we do a Docker run, run the sample application. So in this case now, we run, it should load everything up, and should do an inference. And so uh, there it goes, it's launching everything, uh, running inference, and the inference value of the test image is eight. So now I'm able to use that model that we just trained and get a meaningful result. And so we're hoping that this basis for folks even just experimenting gives them a quick way to get up and running for both TensorFlow and potentially Project Chris. So this is a valid uh, Chris plugin code that we've got here. Can't find my mouse. Got it. So now we are going to see how to do the build and deployment on OpenShift. Again, like the Docker local build, first you do is get the CentOS base image. You can also have UBI 7. We just use CentOS. You can also use RHEL. The reason why we are not using RHEL is because you need to have a Red Hat sub subscription license to manage the distribution. But uh, since it's an open source initiative, so you can either use CentOS or UBI. And after that, these are both publicly available. And then we installed CUDN, which is CUDA distribution of deep neural network libraries. And what it essentially provides is an optimized implementation of various uh, deep neural network algorithms, like how to do activation layers or how to do forward and backward propagation. You can totally write this on your own as well. But it's it's uh, if you use this, it's a highly optimized and highly tuned implementation. Then we needed CUDA Toolkit, which will give you the compiler, or essentially the entire SDK, which is needed to develop GPU accelerated application. And then you need a runtime so that you can run your application as an, or distribute your application as an executable without necessarily giving away the CUDA binaries, which is not allowed. And then with all these things, you have your base container, which would act as the builder container for the next step. So that when I'm going in the next step, I don't do all these steps. And the reason is like, you are hardly gonna change any of it. Like if you are optimizing your model, you wouldn't say, no, I don't wanna use 3.6. My model will work better if I go to 2.7. That's not gonna happen, right? So if it's better that we have all these layers built and the image ready, so that in the next step, you just use reuse that image and not build everything from scratch. And you cannot push this into a public repository like Docker Hub because of the licensing around CUDA. So what you need to do is you need to push it into your uh, private repository, which in our case is the default repository with OpenShift that comes. You can also push it into the, your private GitHub repo and or each time you just pull it and use it. But that's not recommended. But if you don't have anything else, that is doable. The next is like you just take your base image, which will have CentOS, Python, and CUDA, and just add TensorFlow on top of that. Now, at this point, people might be asking, why am I installing TensorFlow on this layer? It's like TensorFlow is a dependency for the application source, right? Ideally, people do pip install minus our requirements or txt, and they specify all the requirements over there. So the reason behind is, again, tens installing TensorFlow, and specifically for this demo, we have installed optimized TensorFlow for CentOS and not a general distribution of CentOS, it takes six minutes, like we calculated that. It takes around five to six minutes to do installation. And imagine all you wanted to do in your application is add a print statement or like add some debugging level. And if you rebuild your application, you are adding five minutes every time you are building that application. So that's why we have introduced an intermediary layer, which is a TensorFlow layer, and we installed the optimized version of uh, CentOS you also have for REL and UBI. And once you do that, you again push this image in your internal registry that will act as a builder image for the next step. 
The final layer is the application layer when you're going to use the base image that you developed in the previous and inject your application code. So at this point is all when we are introducing the Python code, like we are pulling a Python code from the GitHub and we are injecting into the existing build builder container that we created in the previous step. Then we will assemble it by running the assemble S2I scripts and we will train and save a model and commit this image to our internal registry. So now this application image has your application source, all the required dependencies, as well as the trained model onto it. And now if anybody wants to do inference, all they have to do is run a container with this image and give it the input or the test image that it wa you want to classify and it will give you the output. Okay, so in, in my scenario and in the idle scenario, what happens is the platform where you where you are running your machine learning workflow is different from the project where the developer was creating the image. So in my case, I don't have access to the radiology project where the Chris uh, job framework is running. So in such scenario, you need to give uh, access to the service account of the project that would be pulling the image from a different project. So this is one of the configuration that you have to do. It's not not mandatory, but in case somebody has this kind of working situation as I had, so this is one step that you need to add. And you also need to do some configuration as to let OpenShift Scheduler know that it that the container may ask for a GPU resource. So you need to make certain environment configurations, and you have to make sure that you give the NVIDIA driver the capabilities of both compute and utility, and you need to need, uh, and you specify in the resources that this container or this pod might require or might ask for GPU. Now I'm going to show you the code demo. So the first step is building. I have already built the CUDA dependent builder image because it takes a lot of time. It takes literally a lot of time. So even showing a video would not have helped. So in this scenario, I already have, as you can see in my project, images that has CUDA uh, into it. So if I go to image, you see that, that CUDA has all of that CUDNN, the runtime and everything. So now all I need to do is pull this image and I upload a template and which will install TensorFlow. So all I need to do is change the yeah, so I'm changing the S2I. I'm specifying what base image to take. So this is a base image I uh, generated in my previous step. So I need to change that. And I need to specify where is my, what Python version I'm using, which is 3.6 and the TensorFlow as we have used the optimized version, so there's a link for that. And once all is done, it will start the build process. And you can see it has already initialized. And I'll go to the log and it's downloading TensorFlow and making changes so that, uh, updating the permissions of the container so that it does not need root permission to run. And it is going to take some time, five minutes. Yeah. So I can forward this. It's pretty much just installing TensorFlow. It's like an 80 or 90 meg binary by the time it's done. Right. Just the TensorFlow. And once the TensorFlow is installed, it's pushing them into my internal registry. And now you can see that I have a new image, which is CUDA TensorFlow runtime. Then what we do is we do an S2I build of our application code. So I will take the CUDA TF runtime, which I created in the previous step. I upload my new template, which will do an S2I build of my application. And if you see that I'm just renaming my application to TensorFlow sample, changing my S2I base image to use the one I created in previous step, and it's uh, sourcing it from image stream tag. That is my internal registry. 
and that is the docker file it will use for the s2i and this is my github repo the branch is gpu s2i Now if you see that this step was pretty fast, so imagine if you combine TensorFlow as well as this, it's going to take all that time for just building your application code which is not which is not very optimized. So you see that it's already started the build and these are the S2I symbol script that ran and it has started training the model as well. And the model is also trained and saved at that location inside the image and it has pushed this image to my image stream so I've got like the application image that will have the trained model saved into it now all I need to do is run all I need to do is just run the workflow and to that I would be using Chris platform to do that So Chris picks up the input from the data store. So right now this input folder for TensorFlow app has my image that it has to identify, which is number one, as you can see here. These are handwritten images, so they look a little bit uh, messed up, but that is number one. And, the MNIST set. Yeah, MNIST set. And then all I do is, this is my uh, way to fire the workflow. And you see that I'm pulling that image that I created, and I'm saying I need GPU, at least one GPU node to run this. All I need to do is enter. And the job has been kicked off on OpenShift. You can see that for us, the GPU node is G01, so it's scheduled over there. It has started the container and it has done the inference as well. To verify that, you can see that it says the inference value of test image is one and it has saved the image. So if I just refresh, I see that the output has been created and it has a file that has number one into it. So that, that covers kind of the basics of how we get things up and both locally and using uh, using OpenShift. Um, but now, as your models are in, you want to start using things like hardware acceleration via GPU and some other best practices to kind of get more out of the system, especially in the production environment. So we have divided how to do the optimization and GPU acceleration in two steps. The first one is development and build phase. So uh, as you notice that we have used the optimized version of uh, TensorFlow image, and by that it means is the publicly available image that is given by Google is designed in a way that it runs on majority of the system. But it doesn't mean that it is, it is the highly optimized. So most of the time, even if your CPU is, say, x86, you would get this error, which says that, oh, you have got like good hardware, but your software is not so good. It cannot use your hardware. So that's why we are using the wheel file which is being managed by their AICO team of Red Hat and they try to optimize it to the latest version of the hardware. The next is layer segregation and as we talked earlier that you might have found some uh, importance in like how we segregated TensorFlow with the application and we are saving five minutes each time you're building the image. And then saving the model on the image is critical for us to be able to try to reuse it. So especially given that, you know, potentially large training set, large training duration, um, if we have multiple people working on the team, it's nice to have that quick reuse or quick testing, depending on how we want to manipulate this. Right. And even say like one year down the line, your data set has become obsolete and you want to train your model on a newer data set, all you need to do is reload the existing image and retrain it and not like again train it from scratch. And then if you believe they reuse those artifacts are critical in terms of reproducing a bug, uh, sharing it with other collaborators, or even moving it into production or staging environments. The next is hardware acceleration. So we recommend it if you don't have access to GPU on your development environment, you can still uh, create and optimize your model in the development step and then just re, uh, run the workflow on GPU nodes in the production. So it's not like you're not breaking your head how to do CUDA and everything uh, on GPU on your development machine. And, and just, uh, yeah. And for 
for simple models like what we've got for the example, the difference between the CPU hardware acceleration and GPU is pretty negligible. But you can imagine if, as the model gets more complex, uh, having that extra hardware bandwidth is, is important. And so here we've got um, links to the major projects that are part of this. Uh, we'd love to have more folks contribute to it. Or if you know other folks in, in, in your circle of friends that might be interested, uh, let us know. Um, even from my own side, I, I have a, a child who's got leukemia who's actually being treated at Boston Children's Hospital. And so that's part of how I got involved with this. So I work at Red Hat from the traditional engineering teams. Um, but being touched by that and seeing how um, ECH and Dana Farber and others are trying to tackle these problems, the fact that I can work on something to, to help with that was important to me and meaningful work. So um, it's a really good opportunity to learn new technology, uh, push the envelope, and it doesn't just have to be AI machine learning, right? So we've got UI, UX folks working on the interfaces there. I have been a graphics multimedia guy, I've the job I've done in the past. And so the ability to apply that uh, to some kind of cutting edge problems um, is an interesting space. And I've already talked to some folks in the audience that will things kind of branch out. Um, so give it a try. We're, we're easy to contact. Um, and, and we're happy to have more folks uh, contribute to this effort. And now we are happy to take questions. And the gentleman just got a microphone and stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. That was a great talk. Um, I have a question, though, about trying to... The strategy you use about trying to accelerate the whole building the container and track, you know, optimize that process. So what I do is I just map or volume map my source code into my container image. So each time I just run that container again and again and again, and there's no penalty because I'm changing the source code while debugging. And there's no need to rebuild the whole thing each time. So I'm just wondering why did you guys not do something like that? Uh, one thing is, uh, well, that that is a good way. But what if you don't want to? Uh, okay, so you're mapping a volume, right? That. That is a totally fine way, but what we are trying to use over here is maximize the feature that is given by S2I, because the, uh, that is totally legit way to do it, but we, this is a more recommended way. And also, because we are taking CUDA libraries from the source, so we cannot uh, you know, like just pull the image. So we have to build from the source each time. So that's one of the reasons why we are doing that. And again, uh, even if you have uh, map the volume. How do you address the problem if there's a bad, if there's a security issue in one of the layers? You will still have to rebuild all of them, right? So it's not just we are, you know, solving the problem at the application layer. We are trying to solve the problems at all the layers. And, and one of the other challenges we have is finding a meaningful sample. And so a lot of folks will get started, get a base container working, um, but they can't actually get to production. They can do acceleration. So but providing a clinical example, folks can go grab and modify. It. Uh, that was important part of this effort. Hi. Hi, I was just looking at the demo. Um, so when you're so you're doing a build and then you're creating a model mm -hmm. and then are you deploying that model to TensorFlow serving or or you just have that container and then... Uh, no, we're not using serving over here. What we do is just we save the model inside the container and then we just run the container. But, but if you had another container that was running serving, you could then go uh, share information through that so you can pass it to run off of the TensorFlow serving instance. Okay. But in this demo, we don't use TensorFlow serving. We just try to keep it scaled. It's just a quick ramp up. Why didn't you combine the Tensor IT provided by uh, by uh, Nvidia? They they publish uh, containers that already uh, wrap around most of the tooling you presented. Uh, what I understand, there's again the licensing issue over there, and what we try to do is like build a solution where you don't have to pay a dime. Part of the other piece was around um, the Project Crystal that we're using too, so that basically didn't have it. 
that some of the work can build around that is um, more trouble than it's worth. Um, I feel like the, uh, the one of the most difficult part of it, of building that base image is creating the assemble script, right? Because you need to define like a standard where you're gonna receive the model or, or where you're gonna receive the data or whatever. Or how you're gonna run that or how you're gonna pick that data and execute that. Um, do you guys have any guidance on how to build that assemble script specifically for that image because I saw that you run and you train and you execute and you save the model. So I'm, I'm guessing that you need to have some standards to, to run that against like a specific path or receiving that in a specific path because you are not mounting volumes, right? right. You are just receiving those in a specific uh, place. In, in, the, in the sample code, there is some pieces there where there are kind of some default locations, you know, kind of like uh, uh, for, for the libraries and some of the pieces of code. And one of the other challenges of running in an open shift environment as opposed to running locally is in the user ID. And so that there's some uh, nice stuff tape and glue that we've got in there to kind of keep things happy. So like what I run locally wouldn't work when we put open shift, so we kind of have to go back and uh, tweak that to run as, you know, user ID, you know, 1001 and some other things like that. And yeah, I'm the, trying to show the assemble script that we have. You can. Um, yeah, and, and so um, the user ID was one, the location, um, the ability to use it in a meaningful way, right, in terms of the launch that uh, what well, command line you want to do, those sorts of things. We've got some um, fairly standard things that we use to just try and make sure that's consistent. So if somebody were to go grab this and just want to swap in a different model, right, so there's a relative code that kind of save the model and load the model in a simple way. So you can take the sample as is, take a model you develop elsewhere, as long as you can load it, and then just plug it in and play around with it. You can check out our assemble script, but for us, the biggest challenge was how to modify it so that it can run in OpenShift, because OpenShift doesn't let you run a container with root, and when you build containers locally, as Bill mentioned, yeah, so it's like there was a small tweak that we had to do, but it's there in our assemble script. A, a lot of the uh, base image that we provide on the, on the registry, uh, they, they, they do execute like a fixed, uh, fixed permission script right. just to, just to as, exactly solve that issue. So. Yeah. Yeah. That is all we have to present. Are there any other questions? Um, so, like you mentioned, there's like licensing issues with CUDA, right? Um, so, are the like are CUDA alternatives on the roadmap for you guys, like Rockham or Sickle or something? It's less our roadmap and more TensorFlow, right? Right. In this instance. Yeah, and it's open source, so like there's no. Yeah, but I, I think like the why we chose CUDA over here is because when we were kind of like polling what people find more problematic, like myself, I was, I had a really hard time using CUDA when I was at university, so that was the motivation behind it, and also. Uh, and from my side, we donated some of the hardware that's in this PSI environment. Um, for other projects, right, that was doing a specific we needed uh, in the hardware. Okay, so it's kind of right. right. That's right. That that's right. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, guys.